Welcome back to the uh, Wandering Wesleyan. I'm Chaplain Greg, and uh, we're doing our Walking in the Word series. If you are enjoying this series, please like and subscribe, share, comment below, and uh, send me an email if you want, wanderingwesleyan at uh, hotmail.com. And uh, last week, we finished up the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, so now we are moving into the New Testament, but I wanted to take one of our sessions here to talk about the time period in between when Malachi was finished and Jesus appeared and uh, the New Testament started to be written. This is called the intertestamental period. So if you remember our history, uh, we had Israel under the judges after Joshua and the judges then turned into kings starting out with Saul and then David, and David uh, had his son Solomon. And after Solomon, the kingdom split into north and to south. Uh, the southern kingdom, Judah, had a few good kings and a lot of bad kings. The northern kingdom, Israel, had terrible kings. Every single one of them were terrible. And God prophesied through the prophets over and over again, that if they did not repent and turn back to him, they would go into exile. And to exile they went. The northern kingdom went first into exile. They went because the Assyrian Empire came down and they conquered, uh, they conquered the northern kingdom, almost conquered the southern kingdom, but because of Hezekiah's faithfulness and the words of Isaiah, uh, they survived. Um, however, it didn't last because uh, Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, brought them right back into idolatry, uh, the worst idolatry Judah had ever seen. So um, that's that was what eventually led, even though there were a couple of good kings after Manasseh, um, that's what eventually led to the Babylonian Empire. Babylon had conquered uh, the Assyrians, and Babylon then went down and conquered Judah and brought the Judeans into exile, okay? So you remember all of that history and eventually the Persian Empire. So we're talking about modern day Iran and modern day Iranians don't call themselves Arab, they call themselves Persians because that's who they are. That's historically who they are. The Persian Empire became the greatest empire um, that the world had seen at that point covering uh, massive amounts of territory in uh, the Middle East and into uh, Southern Europe and Turkey and all that, all that area. It, it was in a massive empire. So uh, the Persian Empire uh, took over and they allowed the Judean people and uh, the Jewish people to return to Israel. And uh, so does the story end there? Absolutely not. History just rolls on. So the, when we end the Old Testament scriptures, the Persian Empire is in control and they're the ones that are um, basically the world force, the greatest military and political power the world has ever seen until Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great's uh, father, Philip II, uh, was a conquering king. So he was a king of uh, the northern part of Greece called Macedonia. And his army that he put together, the Macedonian army and all the other armies, was just this tremendous force. And his son, Alexander, inherited this force. He also inherited his father's ambitions. So Alexander the Great uh, started his empire, the Greek Empire, which reached the Persian Empire in 331 BC and defeated the Persian Empire. 331 BC is when the Persian Empire goes down, but Alexander doesn't live that much longer. He dies in 323. Okay, so just a few years later, uh, less than a decade later, Alexander dies. But he has conquered great, huge amounts of land. And his empire is huge. And he has four generals underneath him that, dec that decide to split this empire into four 
different parts. Um, the part that we're interested in is the part under General Siliculus, okay? So this is Alexander's general over the region of Israel, and he begins the process known as Hellenization. What is Hellenization? Hellenization is an important thing that will affect Israel for centuries to come. And it will bring a new language, a universal language into Israel, and that is the Greek language. But Hellenization is a forcing of Greek language, customs, culture, and gods onto the peoples of that region, including the Jewish people. So there was a forcing of people to speak Greek. It was illegal to speak any other language. It was forcing people to worship Greek gods. Um, it was at this time that the Decapolis, now what is the Decapolis? Deca meaning 10, polis meaning cities. The 10 cities were developed and that's on the eastern edge of the Sea of Galilee. All right, so that's gonna play an important part in Jesus's ministry, because these cities have sprouted up, and these are Greek pagan cities. Um, and these were pagan cities that, by and large, raised the kind of livestock that Jews wouldn't eat, pigs. And, um, and, and, and so these cities were, were very important to the region and to the Hellenization of Israel. Now, in 175 BC, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes takes over from Seleucus, and Antiochus Epiphanes is uh, a terrible, terrible person. He's just, he's awful, and he forbids the worship of Yahweh under penalty of death. He desecrated the temple, almost destroyed the temple, but he desecrated the temple by garrisoning troops in the temple and then sacrificing a pig to Zeus, because if you're worshiping Zeus, you, you sacrifice pigs. Cool, huh? Uh, he did that in the temple. Can you think of a worse sacrilege to do to a Jewish temple than to sacrifice a pig in the temple? But Antiochus Epiphanes isn't without resistance. There is a family called the Maccabee family, and there's a group of books in um, the Apocrypha. Now remember, the Apocrypha are books that were written, Jewish books that were written, largely in Greek, uh, after Malachi and before the New Testament. Now, these books aren't considered scripture by our Jewish friends or by uh, Protestant Christians, but some of these books are considered scripture by our Roman Catholic friends and uh, our Orthodox friends because uh, these books are, are not unimportant. They're, they're important works and they talk about very important things, but they're not considered scripture, but they're not bad to read. Sometimes we as Protestants, we think, oh, the Apocrypha, that's what our Catholic friends read, and so that's bad. No, these are important books, and every Protestant should read the Apocrypha if you're serious about scripture. So back to our story of the inter intertestamental time, Antiochus Epiphanes is meet, met with resistance by the Maccabee family in Israel. And the Maccabee family leads a revolt. He, they tear down the statue of Zeus in, in Jerusalem in 164 BC, and they reclaim the land. Antiochus dies before he could reclaim Jerusalem. And that's where we get the festival of Hanukkah. You wonder where Hanukkah comes from? It comes from this period. Because you remember, there was always supposed to be a light in the temple, the near Tamid, on a lamp. And that lamp would always have to have oil replenished over and over again. And they ran out of oil. But miraculously, the light kept shining as a symbol of God always being present with his people. 
So let's talk about something else that happened during this intertestamental time. Remember, this is a time of Hellenization. The Greek language is spreading. And in Alexandria, Egypt, Alexandria, named after who? Alexander the Great. Uh, in Alexandria, Egypt, um, there is forming a very academic culture. And all pe a number of academics and learned people, the greatest library in the known ancient world was in Alexandria. And so all of these people are, are, are going to Alexandria and they're learning and they're developing things and science is, is exploding and um, literature and all sorts of things, you know, the, the writings of Socrates, the writings of Homer, all of these are brought into Alexandria. And there's a Jewish population in Alexandria. And uh, they designate around 70 scholars to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And that's where we get the Septuagint. Now, you're going to hear me talk about the Septuagint a lot as we get into the New Testament. And why is that? Because the Septuagint was the common form of scriptures that were read in the in Jewish's in Jesus's ancient world. Now the Jews would have their their Hebrew versions, but as soon as you got out of Judea in Israel, they were using the Septuagint because Greek was the common language. The Septuagint uh, is quoted all over the place in the New Testament. Um, and when the New Testament writers quote the Old Testament, frequently they use the Septuagint, the Greek version. Of the Old Testament. The Septuagint also contained the Apocrypha. All right, so that's where that comes in because it was used in the Septuagint. Our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters and our Orthodox brothers and sisters see those books as legitimate. All right, so we have this, this new Greek form of the scriptures in place. We have the Greek, the Greek Empire divided into four parts and eventually defeated by Antiochus Epiphanes by the Maccabees. We have the next empire that comes up. All right. So the Roman military, Rome is now a big deal. Rome has taken over much of the world that, Greek, that Greece had taken over. And a military leader by the name of Pompey came into the territory in 63 BC. And he came into Jerusalem and he conquered Jerusalem and, he, and it was placed under the Roman Republic. So let's step back a little bit. Rome is bringing what's called the Pax Romana or the Peace of Rome. Order and justice is really important to the Roman Empire. And so Israel and Jerusalem is really at the outer edge of the Roman Empire at this point. Uh, Pompey comes in, he sort of takes over. It really isn't a big military victory there. He's sort of allowed in there. And he doesn't do a lot of disruption because one of the things that the, the Roman Empire is big on is letting local people be local people. As long as they paid tribute to Caesar, as long as they paid tribute to Rome, they were okay. Now, there was a fellow, a Jewish fellow named Herod, who was in Rome, educated in Rome, came back to Israel and declared himself king in Israel. He was more like a governor. He wasn't king with absolute authority, but he did have some authority over there, subjugated to Rome. Herod, whose family line was part of the Jewish diaspora, so remember the diaspora is when the Jewish people were scattered throughout the, the region that we're talking about, which is uh, Southern Europe, Rome, Italy, Greece, Turkey, uh, Macedonia, all, all of this area. Um, his family was a part of that and part of the previous exiles, and they were all returned and he became king of Israel, and this was in 37 BC. He invited Rome to rule 
as an effort to avoid military destruction because Herod had seen what Rome did to other nations that resisted. If you resisted Rome, you were devastated. If you welcomed Rome in, you flourished. You did okay, and that's what Herod wanted. Rome became an empire under Augustus Caesar in 27 BC, and this is the world that is developing and the world that very soon, a few decades later, Jesus is going to be born into. So I want you to think about that. The Pax Romana, the Roman control over the region, bringing stability. Stability is a huge thing for the Romans. Uh, developing a system of roads because Roman garrisons need to be developed and then there needs to be supplies brought back and forth. Roads are being developed all throughout southern Turkey, uh, Greece, Italy. Shipways are being developed. Uh, naval uh, advancements and technology is happening. All of this is happening when Jesus is born. It's sort of like God knew exactly the right time for Jesus to come. And he orchestrated humanity in such a way that when Jesus shows, when he shows up on the scene, the world is ready to hear a message. But that's for next week. We're going into the New Testament next week. We're going to start with the Gospels and the book of Acts. We're going to skip John until the very end of the series. We're going to talk about John at the end of the series. Um, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke... And then the book of Acts, that we'll talk about the Apostle Paul and his writings and then the other writings. And uh, we're going to see how the Jewish scriptures that we've just spent so much time studying are coming into fulfillment. And this intertestamental time in between when the Jewish scriptures end and the New Testament begins sets up the ability for the gospel to go into the whole world. So until then, this is Chaplain Greg. I hope you're enjoying this series, uh, Walking in the Word. If you do, please like and subscribe. Uh, I'd love for you to share these videos and uh, post a comment below, as well as uh, send me an email if you have any questions or concerns. Um, WanderingWesleyan at, at hotmail.com. But until next week, God bless.